in my head, I was like, I must not move. Like if I make the smallest movement, it's going to hurt horribly. So I just like went into almost a meditative state where I was like breathing extremely slowly, just focusing on my breathing. There is a way for you to psychologically modify your pain in the same way that you can feel physical pain from heartbreak. Basically, your body shut down from emotional pain. So it definitely, psychology has a huge power on on the neurological part of it. What's up, guys? Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Before we start, this is a quick announcement to let you guys know that I'm dropping bonus episodes on Auxoro Premium. For $3 per month, two if you sign up for the year, you get a two-hour bonus episode every month of my show, The Ox, that covers exciting and sometimes twisted topics like MK Ultra, the COVID lab leak hypothesis, Tim Dillon, Tom Cruise, the Tuskegee experiment, the obesity epidemic, and more. You also get monthly solo episodes with my takes on drugs, sex, money, creativity, mindfulness, and you have the ability to submit topic suggestions for both of my shows, The Ox and The Oxoro Podcast. Expect three hours of new exclusive podcast content per month, including access to all archived episodes found nowhere else but Oxoro Premium. Visit auxoro.supercast.tech to sign up today. Only $3 per month, two if you sign up for the year. Again, that's auxoro.supercast.tech. Link is also in the episode notes. Come join the premium gang today. This time, I sit down with Julie LeBeau. Julie is a neuroscientist finishing her joint PhD at Yale University and University of Maastricht. And she is also my girlfriend. When I'm saying her qualifications uh, of Yale University and, and neuroscience, it always makes me feel like a little bit of an asshole when I introduce her to new people. Not my friends, but sometimes new random people when you're out and people ask, oh, what is, uh, you know, what does your girlfriend do? And I say, she's a neuroscientist. And some people that are insecure will almost become defensive and they'll be like, oh yeah? Like, wh- well, where does she, where did she study? Hoping that it will be some school that they've never heard of and I say uh, she's she's studying right now she's finishing her PhD at Yale and (laughs) that almost makes me feel like I'm saying yeah my girlfriend is better than yours Uh, she is uh, the smartest person I ever met which uh, in a lot of ways is true she's definitely way smarter than me she has a focus in pain, more specifically neuropathic pain and different drug responses with pain. And I look forward to releasing this conversation into the world because I was able to tap in to her incredible knowledge base on what happens to our body when we experience pain. We also spoke about how we met on Hinge, which for the record, she messaged me first. So I hooked a neuroscientist. Uh, we also got into the peer review process, which I don't really understand. And as an outside observer of the science world, peer review to me does not make sense. It's like you do all this work as a scientist. You prepare it. You write up a paper. You have a hypothesis. You do your best to prove that hypothesis. And then before you can publish that paper out into the world, you have to have your colleagues and many times your competition review that work. And to me, that's just a clusterfuck of incentives that are, you know, not always truthful and not always good that are, that are clashing in the peer review process. It would be like if before I had to release this podcast, I had to send it to my competition for their feedback instead of just releasing it. And you know, that's a very basic generalization of the peer review process. And I definitely did change my view a little bit during the conversation. So maybe you will, maybe you have a different opinion of peer review, but that that was also a a decent chunk of the conversation, as was painkillers and the opioid crisis. We got deep into uh, how painkillers work and what we can do about the current crisis going on in the United States with opioids, uh, prescription drugs, illegal opioids, and some possible replacements for opioids. What can we do? So we get into that. And we also get into the question of what is reality? What is really going on? Is this a simulation? Is everything that's happening real? Are there layers to reality? Can we see everything? And I'm excited to release and present to you 
this episode with Julie LeBeau, the neuroscientist, finishing PhD candidate, and my girlfriend. Please enjoy. I'm here with Julie LeBeau, who is a neuroscientist. She is a current PhD candidate at Maastricht and Yale University, and she's my girlfriend. And I'm excited. I'm excited for this conversation. I'm excited for this podcast to get into some things that we normally get into anyway in our unrecorded conversations. This is the first recorded conversation that we're having. And this is also the first podcast that I've recorded with someone who I've made the sexy time with. So <laughs> this is we're breaking new ground here on the Auxoro podcast. We uh we're uh, in exciting territory, so thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. So I thought a good place to start before we dive into the science, more, not, not technical stuff, but more, I guess, uh, more related to your career. I thought before we dove into that, it would be fun to get into how we met, mm -hmm. and we had the typical covid meeting during you know we met over hinge mm -hmm. we we matched on the uh the, the dating app hinge and you actually sent me a message first and so i thought mm -hmm. it could be fun for people just to give a little idea of what we each thought of each other's <laughs> profile the first time we saw we've already, we've already done this a, a little bit to each other but i thought mm -hmm. we could do like an in detail what did you think first glance like pops up message if you could kind of disregard, if possible, what you know about me now. If just put yourself back into that moment where yeah. you first matched with me. What did you think? I mean, the first thing, like, your entire profile was just videos, which obviously stood out compared to the typical photos. And you always get the same, you know, you've got a guy with a fish or a dog and then, like, a group picture and you don't know which one it is. So, like, the fact that you have video format and... As, you know, a podcast host, you really knew how to, like, talk to the camera and kind of, like, flirt with it. And so it definitely went through. I did a couple spins to the camera. Like, I timed it where I was turning around and talking at the same time, which took me <laughs> took me a few takes. But I, I think I got the hang of it pretty quick. But, yeah, the, the video aspect. So I basically, like, I was... I only had photos on Hinge, like most people. And then they did an update where they allowed you to upload videos to Hinge. And it kind of went under the radar. Like, they didn't announce it on Hinge. Like, you can upload videos now. It's just like I, I saw when I was uploading, it said MP3 or MP4 file for video. So I thought, why not play to my strength? Why not record something and show, bit, show a little bit of personality? And it got me more messages that were either very enthusiastic or very like you're a creep like you please never like please get off hinge like i i got uh one girl who told me uh what did she say i found the worst guy on hinge <laughs> she was uh actually uh she had a pretty big following new york city on instagram she tagged me in a story that said the worst guy on hinge so that that was my approach going into the whole online dating app her mistake my win mm. and i'm not recording a podcast with her so yeah that's true yeah um wh what was the most awkward dating interaction that you've had whether it was over hinge or over an actual date what's something that stands out on your mind where you think i can't like i can't believe this is happening right now like this is something that's actually being exchanged between two people no with you <laughs> i mean it could be with me it could be it could be anything it could be a message it could be in person it could be with me um, uh, it could be a previous encounter i mean the one that would stand out right now like the guy was super sweet but like very intense like first time i meet him first date it felt like i was having lunch with someone i'd been dated dating for like six months and but you know i was like you know he's just a little intense but he's sweet he seems like a good guy um but like then the day after i think i, I had another date and i woke up after and so i had a missed call from him after i hung out one time 
And I was like, is everything okay? Why did you call me, basically? And he was like, oh, I was just thinking of you and I had a rough day and so I wanted to talk to you. And I was like, mm, that's a bit weird for someone you've just met. And did you say that to him when you picked up the phone? Did you say, I um, think you're the weirdest person? I mean, I didn't met. pick up the phone. I like just got the Miss text. Call, and, Miss call. Yeah. And, and I was just kind of like a bit weirded out being like, okay, I'll just uh, step aside. And funnily enough, uh, one of my friends had actually dated him as well, but like met him not on a dating app, just like at a club and stuff. And also had a really weird experience with him. So... Well, in his defense, uh, <laughs> since I know him very well, yeah. uh, you're actually talking about uh, Rashad. Uh, uh, no, I have no, I, I have no idea who this guy is. But in his defense, I'll defend this person that I've never met. I will say that at least he went for the call because I mm -hmm. feel like a lot of people, and including myself, time dating interactions especially in the early stages first two to three dates like it's like methodical like yeah. i'm going to wait at least 36 hours before i send her a mm -hmm. text message and then i'll wait 12 hours after that right. to respond again if she doesn't respond and then if she responds i'll send a message maybe a picture of something that i did that day but not before the mm. second text message interaction you can't lead with a picture well, that's yeah, just you, weird you've got you've got rules and like and that's the thing too on the first date and and like there's a fine line between being super sweet and super creepy and you know first it's date, how you look it's yeah. uh i i have this theory that you can basically get away your your window of getting away with interactions on the smooth to creepy range mm. is much it is wider the better looking you are you're you, you doing something like showing up to a woman's workplace <laughs> with flowers or even the other way around like the man's workplace the woman has yeah. flowers depending on how hot the person yeah. is affects how you receive that same interaction if a guy who you didn't think was hot did the same exact thing like same color flowers right. uh same card everything like had a great night last night depending on how hot that guy was you would be like either ew or yeah like this this is kind of cute like, i like this yeah i mean fair enough but it's also essentially how much you like the person and so like if you did something like that i'd be like oh that's so sweet because you're my boyfriend but like if it only been one date and you did something super romantic i'd be like a mm, bit weird yeah yeah i feel like i feel like the romantic gestures I don't know. I, I mean, you know me. I don't really do that many romantic gestures. But when I do, they're bigger. It's more... Mm. So the way that I know that I care about you is that I have something in my subconscious that makes me do smaller... Or not makes me, but I want to do smaller actions to let you know that I give a shit. <laughs> During the day, even when I mess up on some of those actions where you know i forget to do shit like i pee all over the toilet seat and then leave it up <laughs> for you to sit on i i have this motor running in my head that makes me want to do the small things for you and then on special occasions i will say all right i need to go all out on this like however it ends up i'm gonna like the one thing i'm not gonna do is go into it thinking that i should have done something more or i should have planned more for this like however she thinks it is like even if she hates it like i'll feel good because i'm like all right well at least i went yeah. for it so with, like the romantic gestures i feel like have a time and place and it's definitely not early on mm -hmm. i mean you want to show like you know some form of sweetness interest and all but like you need to kind of like hold hold it together a little bit you know if you're like really into someone you gotta like play those games where you're like mm -hmm. you don't necessarily show that you're not interested at all because we're not in middle school anymore mm -hmm. and but at the same time you know you don't want to become too like clingy and stuff too fast so you gotta pace yourself and yeah play your cards right okay and, well how about me like we talked about your profile but how about my profile your profile so i actually made a note about this in uh later on when we're going to talk about more travel stuff adventure mm -hmm. stuff that you've done mm. you f at, at first you struck me as the typical girl who posts 
the one time they went hiking to make it look like they yeah. do it as part of their routine, w- which is what I tried not to do in my profile. Like I, people probably saw my profile and like, you're, you're a piece of shit or I like it, like whatever. It was mostly videos. And so people took it as they did. But with you, my, so my impression was that you, you posted like, I think you had like the glass at a winery or something. Mm-hmm. And then you had the photo of you on top of a mountain yes you had the you had the typical you had the typical basic bitch profile like basic bitch instagram profile of like these small snapshots of your life are meant to be taken as broad strokes where it's like i i'm not just someone who takes a picture of hiking i am someone that hikes all the time Mm -hmm. and you know some people do post pictures of hiking and they go hiking all the time but i didn't know and i was so used to seeing girls on hinge where they would uh, the one of the prompts on hinge which is my favorite it would say uh what's your favorite travel story and then girls would just list a country they would say like (laughs) brazil or peru story and i'm just like like what is the story what is the story of brazil like give me Give me like just the basic intro, middle, conclusion that we learned yeah. in fourth grade. Like I went to Peru, <laughs> rode a camel, and then went back to New York. Yeah. Even that would be a story. But for you, I thought you were kind of that girl. And then as we went on, I basically realized that you're the anti-influencer because you do all <laughs> these shit and you <laughs> never post about it. You've posted one picture. I don't even think you've posted a picture since we've been dating. Um, because no, you're trying I to hide me from one. the world, so <laughs> you asked you you actually asked me to blur your face out for this podcast, yes. so that there would be uh, and change no... my voice too, so I'm fully anonymous. Exactly, yeah. I'll give you a very low voice. Like yeah. it'll be like I'm talking to myself. No, I mean I genuinely try to put pictures out that were repre- well. I look cute, you know. Obviously, I want to look hot to get a boy, um, but also not a man. <laughs> Yeah. Just a boy. I'm just oh, oh man, it's okay. A young too. child. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> underage if possible. Yes. Um, but also that I thought were representative of what I liked, and so it was a picture of me at a winery. But I generally love wine; it's in my DNA, um, mm-hmm. being French. So, uh, and I do hike a lot and travel a lot. So, and I do have really cool travel stories, but they wouldn't fit in the. They wouldn't fit in the story block. <laughs> yeah, it was more than three lines. More than three lines because <laughs> it's an actual story. You know, it's not a country. That's true. <laughs> that is, that is true. You should you should teach a, a hinge class for women about writing stories on Hinge. Yeah, I feel like there should be a hinge class or like just any dating app for both genders because like I remember when, especially for Tinder, when I was scrolling through Tinder, I was like, so many times I thought, dude, like if you posted different pictures, you would actually get girls, but like don't just stop doing that you know yeah i mean i i was uh as you know i was solo for most of the quarantine so when you're sitting by yourself uh you're either you know uh basically all the the fears about the future pop into your head and and you are just like how do i how do i make more money so i don't end up uh homeless like three years from now all all these things running through my head about pyramid schemes like ideas side hustles i'm like damn i I need some i need more of a a parachute in case um podcasting goes belly up so i don't uh, and i also don't want to continue doing the nine to five so one of the things that popped into my head was um being a hinge consultant (laughs) and my guarantee wouldn't be that you would get a good partner it would be that I will get you more messages. Mm -hmm. I will help you shoot videos. And my guarantee is that you will see more messages. Most of those girls may say that you're the creepiest guy I've ever seen Mm -hmm. on Hinge. But the three who message you will be absolutely in love with your personality. And that was going to be my pitch. Like you'll you'll have to do less work because you won't have to decide, you know, is this girl into me? She'll send you a message and be like, oh, my God, like I love your videos or whatever. What's up, guys? This is a quick break in the episode to remind you that if you like this conversation, you'll love Auxoro Premium. Go to auxoro.supercast.tech to gain access to bonus episodes, the ability to suggest topics, and all premium archives for only $3 per month 
two if you sign up for the year. Again, that's auxoro.supercast.tech. Link in the podcast notes. Now, back to the episode. You know, I think that's also something that did maybe bring us closer together. The fact that when I saw in your videos, you know, like you were, you know, like you were up front, like this is me, this is what I'm doing, and I'm making that kind of jokes that, like you said, led to either loads of messages being like, okay, that guy is super cool, which is was the gang I was in, uh, or like this guy is the worst. And I've kind of felt like that for me, where my entire life I said I'm just like Marmite. I don't know if you're familiar with Marmite. It's Who's this- Marmite? <laughs> It's this kind of like jam made out of yeast that they have in the Oh, UK. marmalade? No, oh, no, it's marmite. You, you fed this have, to me once. Yeah, and they have, yeah, maybe. And they have Vegemite in Australia, which is similar. And so the slogan for marmite is you love it or you hate it. And I've always felt like that defines me really well. There's I, like, you, nobody feels really, oh, I don't know how I feel about it. It's like either you like me or you don't. Well, we, we were, I, I remember you gave me a piece of bread at when you were staying at your place in yeah. New Haven. And you said, have, uh, or you didn't even say, have you ever tried Marmite? You just said, try this. And you told me it was Marmite. And all you said was that it has a strong flavor. Mm-hmm. And I remember it was like what you would imagine if the liquid version of cardboard dried <laughs> out in the sun. And it was so, it was like a little crispy, but still a little bit like wet cardboardy. Yeah. And you spread that on bread and gave it to someone and said, this is a little strong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think people that don't grow up grow up with it can't like it. Like Mm -hmm. I personally don't like it, and the only people that I've met that are actually obsessed with it are people that grew up eating it. So, Mm -hmm. so now that we've spoken about dating and Hinge, you know, speaking of dating, you study pain. Yes. (laughs) It's the best transition I've ever made. So you you spent three years studying or three plus years studying yeah. neuropathic pain. Yes. Uh, pain disorders, uh, drug responses to pain, different mm-hmm. drug responses. So for someone like me who only knows what it feels like to be in pain and doesn't <laughs> actually know what is going on, like what yeah. is pain? What What is happening when you experience pain? a a type of pain just in general Mm -hmm. Um, like what's going on in your body what's going on in your mind Um, so I mean pain is a big topic that involves a lot of different parts of your body but simply put you have nerves uh, that run throughout your body you've got some in your fingertips toes in your extremities and generally the ones that you have in the hands and feet are the longest nerves they all come you know down the brain to your spinal cord and then they kind of just spread across your body so you have some in your gut and other organs this is why you can get like a stomach ache even though you don't get like any external stimulus and you've got some in your skin so you you have them pretty much everywhere almost everywhere and so let's say when you have a typical what we call acute pain and you let's say Mm -hmm. uh, touch a needle with your finger those receptors there's receptors in your skin that are connected to those nerves that are going to get activated and send what we call action potential so it's essentially an electric shock that goes through those nerves to your spinal cord and then up to your brain and once in your brain your brain essentially decides whether this is something that requires a reaction if you Like it can then elicit motor functions so that you step away from whatever the source of pain is and eventually as well pain. And so you've got different nerves that have different sizes and some are the bigger one are related to touch and those are bigger because they are myelinated. So they have like a little blanket of myelin, which enables them to go super fast. So you perceive Mm -hmm. touch before you perceive pain. And then you have smaller ones that are directly like linked to pain and so generally those are the nerves that uh, patients with neuropathic pain have uh, issues with so either it's because they had an injury that's led those nerves to basically not reconstitute themselves properly or it could be because of a mutation or diabetes cancer and then you can see that the disease or even the chemotherapy can lead those nerves to degenerate, causing them to basically feel like they're almost always activated um, and sometimes be triggered just by 
hotter temperatures mm -hmm. or other things like that. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what happens. And then you have a lot of other things. You have like opioids. So like morphine is a synthetic opioid, but you have natural opioids inside of you. And so these also play a role in attenuating your pain. Um, so and. And so there's a lot of different things happening in your head, in your spinal cord, in the periphery. So, so okay. So <laughs> let's take something like if this this coffee. Right. I don't know if people can see it. Yeah, this but, coffee. If it was still burning hot. Yeah. And I stuck both of my fingertips yeah, I, yeah. in this coffee. Yeah. I would get this sensation of touch first. Yeah. At like very like in time that we can't even yeah. perceive. Like just like microseconds or whatever mm -hmm. and then based on how based on the level of that touch you said there's an electric shock or electric Essentially, circuit yeah there's an electric stimulus so it's kind of like so action potential are just like waves mm -hmm. waves of electricity so you've got a wave but then activates another wave and so it basically just conducts like that along your nerve and even more interestingly i think in terms of the heat um is something that i've noticed i went to a steam bath a couple years ago and I was just, you know, chilling and there were like droplets coming from the ceiling onto mm -hmm. my skin. And I was, as you know, a pain scientist that <laughs> can't relax and not think about science. I realized that I felt the droplet and almost a full second would go by until I would feel like burning heat sensation. And so every sensation varies. And so you've got like sharp pain, like more, uh, that you can get, let's say, from a needle or from a cut. You have, like, more um, expanded pain that you get, like, if you hit yourself with a hammer. So you've got different stimulus that induce, that activate different receptors. Mm -hmm. So if, let's say, you were to put your hand in a burning hot coffee, that'll yeah. activate heat receptors. And that'll, like, set, uh, that'll, so you'll have, like, you touching water. So you have, like, those mechanic receptors mm -hmm. that will feel the pressure of water against your finger. They'll feel then, the actual liquid. Exactly. Okay. And then the heat receptors get activated. But like, even though the receptors get activated at the same time, you basically, like the electricity that goes through those myelinated fibers, like those nerves that are like much bigger, mm -hmm. will go like super fast, like flash. Okay. Uh, super speed. And the other one will just kind of go like a snail. And so eventually you'll get the message. It's just like really late. Like you're calling from a different country or something. So it's the the touch first the mechanical mm -hmm. aspect and so whether you yeah. stick your hand in coffee or water mm -hmm. you get the sensation that you're putting your fingertips in liquid yeah and then there's a separate yeah. response that will cause you to either keep your hand there or pull it away slightly or mm -hmm. like jolt your yeah, body exactly. away and depending on how strong that response that is that like that's like a reflex you can't control that yeah so like you have like sensor neurons and you have motor neurons that are both involved in those mechanisms and so the sensor neurons are those involved with pain and touch mm -hmm. and motor neurons with eventually that reactivity to just kind of like step away from danger and and basically that happens even without the brain being particularly involved in that and so the brain is more involved in um, in part memorizing and uh, linking fear maybe to certain activities so you, that you don't keep injuring yourself on the same thing. Let's say if you touch a fire for the first time, your brain is going to like make sure that you don't do that again. Mm -hmm. so, otherwise, you'll just lose your hand eventually. And um, sometimes your brain might react inappropriately. So, for example, there's this story that I think is super interesting that was told by a neuroscientist, and I forgot his name, uh, but maybe you can put it in the show notes, who yeah. um, is um, Australian and he used to like walk through the bushes all the time and he felt like twig on his leg and or at first he didn't think of it, of anything of it, so he just kind of continued and later on he realized he was bite, bitten by a snake and nearly died. And so what happened there is that because his brain kind of thought okay we hear all the time like this is probably nothing so there's no need to ring mm. the alarm and be like okay be in pain but then when he took another walk in a similar area he was walking around and then felt horrendous pain and when he took uh when he stopped to look at his leg he realized that it was just a little twigs cut 
But this time the brain overreacted because the last time he underreacted and the person almost died. So this time he's making sure that the person is going to be in so much pain that they're going to do nothing else but worry about what's happening. So their brain learned a response? Yeah, exactly. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, I feel like... Well, so the first one was because of a snake or something? Yeah. That, okay, so don't snakes also have certain things in their venom that will make you uh-huh. not feel it so it'll kind of it'll dull your reaction to pain so they can stay on you longer and like inject the poison or whatever they need so it completely depends on the species so um snakes in particular tend actually to be more painful than uh paralyzing you do have some that do that and then depending on the venomous species it can be One or the other, and certain species can actually even do both. They can choose whether to be paralyzing. So generally, the paralyzing effect that you see is a prey to, um, what is the prey going after again? I forgot the word. The predator. Oh, yeah, sorry. So the predator against prey. So let's Mm -hmm. say a snake. Alien versus predator. It's a good movie. (laughs) (laughs) So let's say if a snake is trying to kill a mouse, Mm -hmm. it's got interest to paralyze the mouse so it doesn't move while it swallows it all. But as a defense mechanism, it makes more sense to put them in pain so that they go away, if you will. So there are certain species that use their venoms as a defense mechanism, like certain ants, for example. Um, So it depends on the species and why they have this venom. What's their purpose? When I hear that, it makes me feel like a lot of what we do as humans is basically paralyze ourselves enough to get through the day while experiencing pain. Like we inject ourselves with paralytics in the form of uh, pain medication mm-hmm. or uh, just like other types of supplements, medications, teas, brews, I don't know, whatever you're into. Like, And I did that a lot as an athlete where I would have certain injuries or twinges in my shoulder or elbows and I'm basically like before every game when I was feeling pain I'm trying to take away that pain as much as possible without impairing me so maybe that would be low-grade anti-inflammatories or something stronger if it was really bad or uh you know, even even a couple of games when I had, uh, well, I had nerve issues for a while, but something that I noticed was that when I went, when I would go out and we were going out to bars in Richmond, when I was drunk, I wouldn't, like I would hit my arm or I would like move my arm a certain way that would normally send a shock through it, mm-hmm. but it was either really dull or not there. So I've even taken shots a few times before I pitched like one or two to where I wouldn't be drunk, but it would dull the nerve Mm -hmm. sensation in my elbow so yeah i mean that it's just like when you were talking about the the paralytic effect it it made me think how we all do that to ourselves Mm -hmm. in some way it's not it's not necessarily a paralytic Mm -hmm. mechanism or substance but it's like dulling the pain enough for us to function whereas like the snake is dulling the pain enough for it to do its job in some cases like we're dulling the pain enough to get through the day for some people yeah and i mean in that parallel as well of uh, of even in pain research when we look for treatments we don't try to eliminate the pain completely because it's like you said like if you can't feel the pain you you could like also injure yourself and 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 i know a lot of people that don't like when they have a headache or they just have like something else going on they don't want to take painkillers because they want to be mindful of let's say a hip that's just like a little stuck or something and if they don't feel the pain they might force force it too much or something like that so and there there are there is a disorder called congenital insensitivity to pain where patients that are born with this disease uh caused by mutation are completely unable to feel pain and these people suffer from horrible injuries and tend to not live very long because they like sorry to be a bit graphic but their babies will chew off their fingers they like will break their nose entirely or just just put themselves at risk because they, they can't feel pain so pain is important and while we want to 
be able to reduce it, uh, whether it's for, you know, a headache or post injury, uh, post surgery or something, but also for people with, uh, neuropathic pain or other pain disorders where we want to take away that extra pain that they feel, but we still need to have like this basic level where they're still able to feel if something is wrong. Yeah. So pain, pain is important. You don't want it to go away Mm -hmm. completely because it's a signal of that there's something wrong. But if you, if you take it away, if you take it away completely, you can be a damage to yourself or others. Absolutely. So, so like, is there a, is there a name for that condition where you don't feel pain you're saying you could be someone who chews their own fingers mm-hmm. off and not even realize it yeah it's called cip congenital insensitivity congenital pain. insensitivity mm-hmm. pain so you could just like if you were an adult and you had this disorder you could slam your finger in a door yeah basically chop it off yeah and then not realize it till 10 minutes later you you're walking yeah. you're walking mm-hmm. down and you're just like holy shit like my fingers gone oh yeah like literally like they can still feel like touch and things like that but they could like have burnt off their hands and realize like at the end of the day that they've just done that so they have the mechanism part of the the yeah. signal but they don't have the separate pain thing that's yeah causing it's, their it's reaction. a mutation in um a sodium like there's two sodium channels that we found it in there is um so very briefly on that there are nine subtypes of sodium channels and they are expressed throughout your body you've got some in your brains you've got some in your heart muscles and also like in those like pain centers and um two of them that are involved in pain specifically i've been found to lose their functions and so these sodium channels they work like gates they are like a gateway that enables this electric signal that i mentioned earlier to go through and so in this patient the gate is essentially completely closed so no Mm. matter how much electricity is being sent their way no matter what they do the gate remains closed so the signal never makes it to the brain so essentially they could be yeah like putting their hands in lava they could be like chopping it off they won't feel a thing yeah it's it seems like in addition to the the pain pathway for physical pain Mm -hmm. whether it's working correctly or not whether you're someone with the the congenital defect or you have pain pathways that are working as they should it seems like that there has to be a separate emotional pain pathway because of the way that people describe Mm -hmm. going through emotional distress and and people will say that and like me uh, myself like obviously i've experienced the same shit where you go through a breakup and you say oh my heart's broken or Mm -hmm. i feel like i've been punched in the gut when people go through emotional pain yeah they use these physical Mm -hmm. sensations to describe it have you seen anything in your work where that like points to a, a something that connects mm-hmm. your emotions to the way that we experience physical pain yeah. absolutely i mean in my work personally no but i know from others work where they did like mri of people that had like emotional pain so like after breakup and and things like that and they had the same areas of their brains highlighted as from physical pain so heartbreak can be felt and it's like it's definitely a it's a weird symptom of pain and in the same way you know like you have people that injure themselves gravely but are able to go back out there and that's something that uh, people were also questioning with like Joan of Arc for example and how when she was almost dead she was able to go back in the battlefield and they actually did some studies again with functional MRIs um, where they had people that were religious Uh, and non-religious people and they were shown pictures of mary of the christ etc while they were giving like small electric shocks Mm -hmm. and what they noticed is that religious people uh with a strong faith felt less pain and so there are like ways to modulate your perception of pain um i know that like a few years ago i dislocated my knee and you started praying to jesus (laughs) not not that but like i I basically, in my head, I was like, I must not move. Like, if I make the smallest movement, it's going to hurt horribly. So I just, like, went into almost a meditative state where I was, like, breathing extremely slowly, just focusing on my breathing. 
And the pain, I mean, I still felt pain, but it it felt tolerable compared to to other pains I've felt. So there is a way for you to psychologically, you know, modify your pain in the same way that you can feel physical pain from heartbreak. And I mean, I don't know any case personally, but I've heard of people who died from heartbreak where like basically your body shut down from emotional pain. So it definitely, psychology has a huge power on on the neurological part of it, let's say. Yeah, I wonder if that same study would show that people could get through pain like non-religious people could get through pain when they were shown something that they believed in even if it wasn't a picture of mary or Mm -hmm. jesus like if you like if you were on wall street and someone like was shocking you and they should open a briefcase of money like a million (laughs) dollars and you were just like like shock me more like i'm like it's i'm gonna go for it Or, or uh you were dad and and someone showed you a picture of your kids or something and uh like no matter what your motivation is even if you're not religious uh it seems like that should work if you if you can have a goal that you you are thinking about while you're experiencing duress or while while you're experiencing pain that keeping that end goal in mind is so important and um I've I've been looking more and more into depression because people in my own family experience it. And one of the things that depressed people will say uh, is that they don't see a future. They don't see an end goal. Mm -hmm. And with the connection between emotions and and physical pain, I know it's like a super generalized view of depression. I, I don't know exactly how the the chemical balances work or don't work but i I do know that people that experience clinical depression will often report that they don't have some long-term version of themselves like when i think of myself i see a version of myself that is 10 years down the line i can imagine what i'm gonna accomplish or, or what i'm gonna look like and what my relationships will be like and what my family and friends are gonna be like location but for people that are depressed, a lot of times they, they that's like a foreign concept to them. Yeah, that's actually very interesting that you're bringing that up because depression and chronic pain. So chronic pain being defined as pain that lasts longer than three months after, let's say, an injury or just for people that born this way. And the comorbidity, so the overlap between um, depression and chronic pain is bigger than the incidence of the two Mm -hmm. separately there's like an 80 percent overlap or something of people with pain that have depression and vice versa like it's it's kind of like a vicious loop where the more depressed you are the more pain you feel the more pain you feel the more depressed you are Mm -hmm. etc because i mean imagine like it's like uh, pain every single day of your life you've you've never seen awesome powers right we talked about it so there's there's a this guy fat bastard in Awesome Powers, it's played by Mike Myers. He plays almost everyone in Awesome mm-hmm. Powers. And there's one line that Fat Bastard says, and he says, I eat because I'm unhappy, and I'm unhappy because I eat. He's like, I eat because I'm unhappy. Yeah. I'm unhappy because I eat. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like the the cycle of, uh, like what when two things are happening to you at the same time, they can tend to feed each other. So that yeah. happens with depression and physical pain. Yeah, I mean, that... that- Again, you know, with pain in general and something that we see a lot with patients that suffer from chronic pain is how much their environment affects them. So if they have like familial support, they have, they have families and friends supporting them, they'll tend to do better than those who don't. If they sometimes even something like living in California where it's sunny all the time versus somewhere where it gets cold. And Is this your pitch and, to go to California? <laughs> yes, this is like, this is where I should go. Um, but like there's so many factors in your environment and, it, and it's like that's something that we can see for ourselves. Like I'm someone that's so whose happiness is so dependent on the weather. If it's a rainy day, I'm going to feel not completely in my plate. I'm just going to be a bit out of it, not as happy as if it was sunny. And I felt like the world was full of opportunities. And that's something that's like, like exaggerated even more in patients with chronic pain. And Mm -hmm. and that's the thing that you see also with depression. And, And you have to also understand like the, 
And that's one of the reasons that drove me towards researching chronic pain is it's, it's a topic that's not talked about enough. And maybe it's in part because the, the number of people who die is not high enough. So it's not as interesting for news outlets as cancer or Alzheimer's research might be. Yeah, but, we, need, we need more people to die that are experiencing <laughs> pain because then there will be more financial support and dollars behind it. Yeah. So if you're listening to this <laughs> and you're experiencing extreme amounts of pain, please just, just pass away for the rest of us so that we can uh, have more funds to study it because that's, that's you know, you're, you're the pain martyr. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what this podcast is uh, all about. Just, you know, just move <laughs> out of the way for the rest of us who are experiencing pain. You're, you're you know, do, yeah. do, do good things. I mean... Sadly, there is a lot more death related to chronic pain than we think there is a lot of people do um, end up taking their lives because, yeah, like if you just try to imagine feeling like you, like even like a paper cut, like all the time, or like you have something in your eye, like all the time. And and those, for those people, like the treatments that currently exist, they either don't work really well, they don't really feel a change, or they have severe side effects. So they spend years just trying to, medicine after medicine that doesn't work and make them feel worse yeah i mean I, i've almost <laughs> i've almost ended my life a couple of times because i had a small dot underneath my <laughs> eyelid <laughs> and i was like this is it if this thing under my eye doesn't go away every time i close my eye it feels like there's a piece of sand if this happens for another 24 hours like i'm uh, this is i'm just gonna take a, a overdose of heroin and just just pass away this is this is how it's gonna end yeah. but no i mean like that's that's a good point like i've I've been lucky that I've never had a constant high or even a moderate level of pain. My pain, whatever it's been, physical or emotional, has always been manageable and it's never been super long term. So I can't imagine people that the best part of their day is sleep mm -hmm. um, where they're just like they're not in any pain at all or maybe they're even dreaming about pain oh no that would suck like if you can't that, even escape that's uh, that's honestly <laughs> one of the saddest part is like for some people while they're sleeping it gets worse really yeah like some people just don't even get sleep so they're when feeling they're, pain in their dreams or nightmares there's people when they shower it feels like the water turns into needles like it's yeah you okay so uh that is small fiber neuropathy Right, we t we spoke about small fiber neuropathy a couple of times, and I remember you said it was people would feel these very extreme mm -hmm. pins and needles sensations sometimes, and yeah. you studied that for a while during your PhD. Yeah, right? so there's there's a couple of disorders that I've focused on, and my group has focused on, including small fiber neuropathy, um, in inherited erythromyalgia. I know it's a bit of a tongue inherited twister. erythroma algae. Melalgia, yes. Melalgia, okay. And there's also like a paroxysmal extreme pain disorder. So these are like a, a few of those disorders that we specifically are interested in from that they're derived from mutations in those certain chunks mm. that I talked about, those gateways. And so these peoples have different um, clinical demonstration of it, but like a common feature that we see in a lot of them is that they're smaller nerves are degenerating causing them to have episodic pain so they like suddenly have pain and this can be triggered by certain things so specifically with people with um, erythromyalgia they generally are born this way and you can see their hands and feet turning like bright red especially when it gets hot and so their daily life since they're children is to spend their summer with their feet and hands in buckets of ice unable to ever wear closed shoes and it's just like these are like things that cumulatively just really impair their daily activities and that's everywhere in their body or is that just the limbs so it's like so like i mentioned before like the longest nerves okay, you have are like in your like hands and feet mm -hmm. extremities and so those start degenerating from the longest fibers and so you can see when you do a biopsy then some of these patients there they have fewer nerves because they're just they're just gone and any form of damage to those nerves will just lead those gateways to just activate all the time so they're super temperature sensitive and like hot will make it feel super uncomfortable mm -hmm. cold will make it feel super uncomfortable so they have to stay in a very Narrow like their weight like yeah. their yeah their range of feeling 
comfortable, which may not even be comfortable for a normal person, but for them, that range is so narrow Mm -hmm. surface-wise or temperature-wise. They basically have to be kind of like sitting in a in a room and not doing anything to not be in constant pain essentially i mean for the colder temperature i think that can happen to some people like it's definitely rarer um but the heat induced um attacks like pain attacks are definitely a big thing for this particular disorder and then for small fiber neuropathy it's there's a lot more diversity in that and similar um disorders to small fiber neuropathy can with like similar clinical um, demonstration you can have from people that develop diabetic neuropathy um, and and some other like um, similar disorder that leads to the degeneration of those smaller pain conducting nerves so as neuropathy that's just something wrong with your nerves yes. like your, your nerve pathway mm-hmm. so small fa- small fiber neuropathy is that similar symptoms to the other one you talked about the alg- yes. uh, erythromyalgia yeah no, no it's absolutely it's very similar so like the biggest difference that they have is that erythromyalgia is inherited so it's like a mutation that's definitely responsible for that and it's a mutation in those gateways and they tend to always show in the same way. So you have them at birth or you start showing syndrome at a very young age. You have it your entire life and you have those like redness that you see in like arms, hands, legs, feet Mm -hmm. um, that like progress over time. And with small fiber neuropathy, you have a lot more range of diversity. It's more like it's not inherited. Some people will be triggered by heat, other by like, just regular sensation some will feel more pain than others and it can be caused by mutation it can be caused by something else and we talk more of factors contributing to uh, the disease rather than a specific cause so when you talk to these people are they like if i if i had constant pain sensations whether it was pins and needles or something that was burning hot or, or, or super cold i imagine i would be pretty miserable and it would be hard for me to be a happy person even about things that i get happy about mm-hmm. um right now like I, I don't know if that would make me happy if i wasn't yeah. feeling good when you talk to these people and you're around them what do they seem like do, do they seem like they're pretty miserable do they seem like they're adjusted to it in some dark way like they're just like this is how the way it is like there's no cure for this so i might as well try to be a little bit happy like what 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 is what do they uh seem like when you're around i mean as a non-physician i have not met that many patients that you know just seek treatment the few i have met are more people that participate in studies Mm -hmm. so these are people that are aware that it's unlikely that the, the treatment might even be fine in their lifetime, but want to be able to contribute helping future people that mm-hmm. will suffer from the same um, uh, symptoms. They, I mean, it's it's a very individual thing, and even with the same disorder, and that's also what makes it so hard to treat, everybody reacts very differently to it. There's people, so there's this pain score that's rated from 0 to 10, that we generally use to figure out how much pain someone is feeling. And so a lot of, it's not as common that they have like a constant, let's say seven out of 10. Most of the time it's more like a two or three. So it's like, it's pain, but it's like, okay. And then Mm -hmm. every once in a while they have like an attack that's like a seven or eight. And then for some people, those attacks are way more frequent. They last longer or their baseline pain is just higher. Mm -hmm. So some people definitely have it harder than others. And, uh, and, and also, you know, some people are more resilient than others. Mm -hmm. Uh, for some people, medicine work better. So it's, it's kind of difficult, but it's, it's completely understandable that, you know, if you've been living with chronic pain for your whole life, like let's say 20 years with it and nothing has ever worked, that eventually, you know, you kind of get desperate. Like, it's kind of weird that we lack empathy for people who 
experience pain, but we can't see it on the outside. It doesn't manifest physically. Like if you saw someone mm-hmm. with neurofiber, uh, uh, neurofi- or small yeah, small fiber neuropathy, neuropathy mm-hmm. uh, like you wouldn't know that they so, had it. So that's honestly, I think one of the saddest part about this that is has been one of the hardest for them as well is and I, I've I've heard this story so many times from telling just people what I do is everyone knows someone or is someone that has suffered from a form of chronic pain. And the thing that we see constantly is disbelief from doctors going from doctor to doctor and them constantly saying, I don't see it, therefore it does not exist. People being like just this difficulty yet to assess the pain and there's some people where you can see it where you do a biopsy and you can see that there's Mm. less nerves there's microneurography which is a technique where basically you can record the electricity in those nerves but there's not that many pain specialists in terms of physicians and even researchers and and so i think that's one of the hard parts is just being told it's just in your head like this is not real and not being treated for it, not being advised for it. Yeah. And some of these people went several years without ever getting properly advised or being told that they were essentially crazy. Yeah, like if you if you had a physical representation of a disease, like it, okay, so if you felt like your hands were burning, you woke up and you felt like your hands were burning there may like a lot of people may not give a shit because you look fine but you're experiencing Mm -hmm. massive amounts of pain but if you woke up and you went out to the street and your hands were on fire Mm -hmm. and you were like my hands are burning and people could see that your hands were on fire everyone would be like oh my god like get this person to a hospital Mm -hmm. like doctors wouldn't give up until they were figure out a way to put out the fire in your hands like they would be like the physical the the physical manifestation of symptoms for whatever reason, I don't know if it's how we evolved or societal uh, implications, but like we just don't care enough about the things that we can't physically see or we're less mm-hmm. likely to believe someone yeah. when they tell you that they feel a certain way, but the way that they feel yeah. can't be perceived from the outside. Mm-hmm. And I feel for those people from a personal level and and i've never experienced anything even close to small fiber neuropathy or the type of people that you were studying but i have had experience with nerve pain in my elbow when i was playing baseball and i would go to a bunch of doctors and i would describe the stabbing pain in my elbow every anytime i threw a baseball or even sometimes i would lift my arm above a certain height and i would get like literally I like I would like jolt my elbow Mm -hmm. got above a certain height like someone just like drove like something super sharp right into my elbow and I would tell doctors this and they would just be like 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 the reaction wasn't like I was telling them I was getting stabbed in the elbow it was like you're over exaggerating and I've never like I I felt I remember feeling really angry and confused because I was always someone who would have played through the pain and then the one thing that I couldn't play through happened to be something that you couldn't see. Mm-hmm. And I got lucky that I had one doctor uh, down in Florida who operated on my elbow, Dr. James Andrews, who's like the goat of uh, baseball surgeries, Tommy John surgeries. Like he's the best elbow doctor to have ever existed. And I was lucky enough to get in with him and we we did the MRI, like we did some uh, some ultrasound tests, like put fluid in my arm and tried mm-hmm. to track it. And you couldn't really see it, but he was like, I have a feeling that there's something blocking your elbow. So did surgery, uh, ended up that there was a blockage on my nerve. My nerve was being pressed up against my elbow, fixed it, did the whole thing. And it, w- it was good enough to pitch after that. I don't think my arm was ever going to be the same because I was playing with nerve damage for so long so even if you know he is the best doctor for that in the world but it wasn't uh it was just my arm it was never going to get back to 100 percent. but during that whole process i remember thinking am i crazy or am i making this up you know am i being a pussy should i like 
should I just throw until it goes away? I remember being up in the cages, in the batting cages in our school and just throwing tennis balls against the wall. And I was like, maybe one of these throws, the pain won't be there. Yeah. and like testing out different arm angles and stuff and like it would never go away mm -hmm. and so it felt really good to have a doctor yeah. validate that yes i believe you we're going to operate i don't know exactly what it is because i guess the the they basically like shocked my nerve and they could tell by the way it was traveling that there was something it was a little bit slower so he's like i don't know exactly what it is but we'll we're gonna open you up and check it out and so for those people that are in 10 times or 100 times more pain than i was constantly because mine was connected to emotion like i could mm -hmm. stop it whenever i wanted to it's just that my job of playing baseball forced me to um be in that pain like i can't imagine you being in constant pain waking up going to a bunch of doctors trying to figure it out and like you tell them that you like you feel these intense burning sensations, stabbing sensations, like pins and needles, whatever it is. And then doctors look at you and they're just like, yeah, whatever. Like, we'll mm -hmm. do a test if it doesn't show up. Like, here's some Advil or like some strong pain medication or whatever. And you're just like, that's not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. No, I think this is where it's very important to to talk about it, to talk about chronic pain. And pain is real. Like, if you... Even if it's just in your head, I mean, pain is a neurological thing, so of course it's in your head. But if you feel pain, there is something off, whether it's something physical that we can actually pin down, or if it's something, let's say, psychological, like, we need to be able to talk more about it. Doctors need to be more informed on this, and and especially the fact that we can't see it we need better diagnosis tests and a lot of research is being done on that um but yeah i mean i don't know if anyone with chronic pain listens to the podcast no matter how many times you've been told that it's not real if you have pain there's definitely something happening mm -hmm. so as someone who's studied different types of pain in depth what is your take on the current opioid crisis going on in the united states and many places across the world like why why w when there's so many other things that seem like they could be good options for pain why do opioids consider mm -hmm. uh, continue to be the number one thing prescribed for pain um even though it's clear that it causes extreme damage and leads to other you know more serious drugs yeah. i mean not, One, not like more serious drugs because uh, prescription yeah. painkillers are super serious. Just like things like heroin or whatever where people can't afford prescriptions or their prescription mm -hmm. runs out and then like mm -hmm. they go on to street drugs. Yeah. I mean, like the, the quick response would be like there's also this crisis because we do not have like clear better drugs for treating pain. Um, that's one answer. And and the the second is that and that's something I try to highlight so far is that pain is very individual and there's not a one size fits all type of treatment that exists. And that is why people with pain generally tend to go through sometimes 10 different treatments that still don't work, that often are inefficient and need to severe side effects. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see, for instance, with opioids, with addiction, respiratory depression, like opioids are not a good drug. But the saying that we're using opioids while we have better options is not necessarily true. It, it might be for some people, and we are working on developing um, drugs that don't touch the opioid route and the whole like reward system that's involved with addiction, etc. Uh, and or rather, instead, a lot of um, pharmaceutical companies and research academics are focusing on looking for treatments that focus on the periphery without intervening in the brain so that we wouldn't have all those crazy side effects that we see with opioids notably trying to aim at those gateway get mm -hmm. something kind of like cip insensitivity to pain but not as far just kind of like block it a little bit like close the gate a little bit but not too much um but unfortunately so far all of this is in development um something that has worked decently for um, a lot of people with neuropathic, well, not a lot, but like some people with neuropathic pain are anti-epileptic drugs. 
So drugs that are normally used for epilepsy mm-hmm. has been shown to work in some patients with neuropathic pain because it targets the same gateways um, among other form of gateways. So like I talked about certain channels, but there's yeah. also potassium channels, calcium channels. So there's electrons kind of like just wiggling around. So the same, cells. the same pathways that can stop seizures or can also yeah. stop pain? Yeah. So like the... Other problem that we have here is that these drugs lack what we call, what we say selectivity. So I mentioned that those channels, those gateways, we have in the brain, we have in the heart, muscles, um, spinal cord, and those nerves. So the and there's different subtypes, and so you have one subtype in the heart, a couple subtypes in the brain, a couple mm-hmm. subtypes in the spinal cord. Um, but the issue is that currently. The drugs that we have that target those gateways, they target all of them. And so you don't want to be blocking the heart, for example. And so now we have side effect issues with those drugs closing all the gates. Mm -hmm. And so we can have like, yeah, like problem with the heart, problem with the muscles, etc. So we are trying currently to kind of like tune, tune it down so that it just like goes to the one subtypes that we're interested in so getting more specific so if you could find a way to target Mm -hmm. these anti-epileptic drugs more kind of give them more of a destination to go to by the doctors choosing Mm -hmm. then that could potentially be a replacement for prescription opioids like mm-hmm. vicodin oxycontin yeah. things like that like that 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 would be the goal right now is to try and find a drug that is only doing something to pain and not touching any other pathway yeah. but that's very difficult because everything is intertwined and those gateways they're very similar so it's difficult to find something that could attract the drug that is unique to the specific gateway involved in pain yeah it's crazy how little guidance go- doctors give you to when they hand you the prescription drugs, whatever. Or it's usually the nurse when you get mm-hmm. discharged. They hand you the prescription or uh, like you go pick it up. And I remember after the elbow surgeries, I had, I think it was like Vicodin or hydrocodone or maybe both. And no one told like I, I had the general you know take one per day on the bottle whatever or whatever it was but no one said you know like only take this if your pain is this high mm-hmm. or if your pain is only like this high you know maybe you know try taking some cbd or just like smoke a little weed or just do some breathing exercises like yeah. you don't like you don't need opioids and, and some people do because they're yeah. in they're in extreme pain and that's the best option right now but there were a few days before i stopped taking it where i thought okay like i'm in some pain right now but i feel like there has to be another option mm-hmm. that isn't full blown yeah vicodin or whatever like like i've been in weed shops in denver that have given me more prescriptive advice for buying Mm -hmm. edibles or uh vape pens than i've Mm -hmm. gotten from doctors handing me vicodin like like if if doctors gave you prescription pills like a guy talked to you in a weed shop or dispensary and said you know this one is gonna have these effects and it'll last for this many hours and you only need to take this much but like also you could take this and only take it if you're feeling like this. And we also could give it to you in this form. Mm-hmm. When I got it, it was just, you know, here's the bottle. Yeah. Take this one, it runs out. You could get a refill. I think I was allowed a refill, even though I, I was I was halfway through the first bottle and didn't need it anymore. But it's I remember thinking like, wow, um, this is like it's kind of crazy. They would hand a 21 year old kid a bottle of pills and like that's it like yeah call me if you have a major problem but Mm -hmm. that's basically all the guidance you get yeah i mean there's definitely alternatives um but again like you say you know like doctors need to be best informed on what is the best drug to give based on Mm -hmm. what your issue is and that's why we need more research that where we're able to kind of like 
figure out based on your genetic makeup, based on, um, you know, how long you've been ill, like what what is your disease looking like? What are the symptoms? What could be the cause? Now that I've gathered all this information, what is the most appropriate treatment to give you based on like how maybe other people that are similar to you reacted? And and there are doctors that are looking for that. There are physicians that run like very thorough diagnostics, but like these are like pain specialists and there's not that many people and you need to be able to travel to those locations where those patient pain specialists yeah. are and not everybody has that luxury yeah and i i also don't think surgeons should have to know that there mm-hmm. should also there should be a separate person that yeah. discharges you that's a pain specialist that mm-hmm. actually studies it because all a surgeon is supposed to be able to to do is to repair you to repair whatever problem they're doing yeah. fix you mechanically and i don't care <laughs> I don't care what that person is like in their personal life. They're a piece of shit. Like they're a good person. All I care about is that they know how to perform the surgery and that right. they do it well. So I'm not blaming the doctors or anything that, oh, this surgeon should have told me what to do. Or like mm. you should have someone there that is able to give you guidance that knows exactly what the drug is going to do to mm-hmm. you or someone like you and then give you at least some sort of guidance. Yeah. I... uh before we move on to some more PhD related stuff, because I definitely want to get into that, um, I looked up some crazy stats about opioid abuse in mm-hmm. the U.S. just to paint a picture. So, um, two million Americans suffered from opioid abuse disorder in 2018, uh, which also includes heroin and illegally made fentanyl, but a, a lot of it was prescription drug abuse, either uh through the actual prescription or pills being mm-hmm. sold secondhand. So 2 million Americans suffer from opioid disorder, uh, which is crazy. It's a lot higher than I thought. And then I saw in the news this week, 42 states received a $26 billion payout from Johnson & Johnson and drug distributors to resolve thousands of opioid-related lawsuits. And so it seems like... Like, I, I don't think drug companies hand out money easily. I feel like there has to be some pretty good evidence for you to get a company like Johnson & Johnson mm-hmm. to hand over $26 billion in opioid-related lawsuits. So it's definitely uh, a, a huge mm-hmm. problem. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm glad there are people like you that are working on it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a big thing. And I mean, I don't know if there's anything backing me up on that. It's just me hypothesizing. But I feel that the opioid pandemic is also badly intertwined with maybe some of the disbelief that doctors show because you have people addicted to opioids that will go to doctors and say that they're in pain and to receive those medications. And Mm -hmm. so I think part of that addiction issue might then lead to people with actual pain that can't Mm -hmm. be diagnosed because it doesn't appear on any monitor that is just like, I don't know if I can believe you because maybe you're just wanting to have medications. Do you want some more coffee before we go to the next topic? Sure, why not? This coffee break brought to you by... (laughs) Folgers. Bring closer to the mic. My dad does that when he pours wine. Goes in. Except he's pouring it into a bowl. Oh, wine, you said. Okay. Yeah. We don't drink water. We only drink wine. Water is wine. <laughs> in Europe. Yes. Okay, so... Tell me, tell me about the PhD process. Like, what is what is it actually like being a PhD student, which makes you a doctor, which I'll give you a lot of shit about because when you officially tell me to call you doctor for the first time, mm. I'm gonna say, oh my god, that's that's so amazing. Like, where are your patients? <laughs> um, but like, what what is it actually like going through the PhD process? You've been at Yale for three plus years. You mm-hmm. started in Maastricht. Like, for people who are thinking about getting a PhD or 
you know, there's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of mythology around like, what is like, I don't know, like what is a PhD mm-hmm. field? Like, is this person actually a doctor? Like, what do you actually <laughs> have to do to get a PhD? Is this right. per- like, what, what is your no bullshit analysis of the PhD <laughs> degree? All right. So, I mean, I've talked about this with a lot of other, either now PhDs or other PhD students. The PhD is not for everyone. It's, it's tough. It's long. It's a uh, it's a marathon. I think that's a great analogy for it. It's it's a really long, tedious road, and you need to know exactly why you're doing it. If if that's just for because you don't know what to do with your life, there's definitely better things to do with your time. Um, but it's also like a very rewarding experience. You are a student. So you learn, um, at least I can talk for like the sciences, you learn to become a scientist. You learn to think critically, design experiments, um, like troubleshoot, figure out ways to um, improve or just go back on your feet and just figure something else out. And you have the help of an advisor and other um, older members of your lab that are here to support you. But essentially, you learn to become independent and, and to eventually, that's what you want to also open your own lab. But like, that's still like a little stage after you obtain your PhD, you can do postdocs. So postdoctorate, um, work where you'll eventually become to be fully mm-hmm. independent. Um, for the no bullshit part, I mean, Putting it straightforward, like, and that's why I insist on it's not for everyone and you need to know why exactly you want to do this. I started my PhD feeling so excited about science, thinking, you know, I'm going to be like Stephen Hawking. I'm going to have this great PhD thesis that's going to revolutionize science. That's just going to be like my great piece of work, like my masterpiece in a way. And Unless you're like part of this, your point is you're one percent of people, and you're like actually get like obviously it's not so much luck, but you happen to have everything work out the way you want. Uh, it's definitely not gonna be that. It's gonna be one of the crappiest work you produce hopefully in your career because you're just a student, and hopefully you know this is this is not when you're peaking. Actually, like let's me side note on that. Whenever I hear people like, oh yeah, I peaked in high school, I'm just like, how sad if you think that the best part of you is behind you and so i feel i mean i don't know if you saw a picture of me in high school but (laughs) especially early on in high school i had a great bowl cut right across (laughs) the top that i would flip up yeah when days when i was feeling good i still had a lot of baby fat on me so i i had the the chubby cheeks early in Mm. high school and uh yeah it was basically like i had my choice of however I wanted to lose my mm-hmm. virginity when I first started high school. <laughs> and I, I was getting so much pressure from people who wanted to take my virginity, guys and girls. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like teachers, students, like back, back up. That early, <laughs> that early sexual trauma made me wait another five years until um, after my freshman year in high school. So it's like... Yeah, maybe I did peak back then, you know? Maybe. Sometimes I think, I mean, should I, I go look, back? When I look at you now, I'm like, I definitely already was better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I really, I don't think you would have had a chance with me back when I was 13 <laughs> years old. I think you would have been like that. Uh, it's just it, downhill from here. Yeah, you, you would, yeah, <laughs> you would have been like that girl that I would give a hug because mm-hmm. I wanted her to feel good like oh like she got to touch zach but oh, like yeah yeah like i'll give her a hug like you know and you had um, that halo as well and and all that yeah you had a halo too but that was just from like the dandruff <laughs> and uh like the the stuff going on in your hair but mm-hmm. uh sorry continue you were talking about <laughs> phd um, yeah i mean essentially, it's it's just i mean it can happen that like everything you plan works out but it's almost never the case uh and that's what science is like it's like you make a theory you try hard you troubleshoot as much as possible and a lot of time it doesn't work at either at all or it doesn't work fast enough and and you have like limited money you have limited time and so you have to give up some projects that you put a lot of heart into and 
And sometimes, you know, it's just beyond your control. It's just that like, um, you need sales or animals and they're just not coming and you just kind of need to replan your entire thing. So, and I think that's also what's great about the PhD is like you fail so much and you have to teach yourself to get back up every time and think of creative solutions. Like you become very resilient. You become able to, to, you know, look at the bigger picture and just try to kind of like figure your way out, even though pretty much every day sucks. And then because you've got one day where it sucks a little less, then you just keep on going. And, um, but you know, it's tough and you gotta be prepared for that. It sounds like PhD is like going through chemotherapy. Like every, (laughs) everything, every day sucks. I wake up (laughs) and the only thing that is on my mind is you just got to keep going. If you don't keep going, it's all going to be over and you just got to get through the the days. Is that an accurate, that's an accurate description. (laughs) Um, so is there, is there a part of the PhD that's beyond hard? It's not just, this is a hard part of the PhD. It's part of the PhD that doesn't make sense or Mm -hmm. the way you see it, it shouldn't be there. And, and for example, me looking back on my own school, schooling, Mm -hmm. school career, uh, one of the things or probably the main thing that showed your intelligence in school is your ability to memorize facts and then regurgitate them on Mm -hmm. tests. There was no creativity. And I got really good, like many other people did. They get really good at memorizing shit and then regurgitating it on command in the form of multiple choice tests, even things that were written. It's just like, tell me about this thing that you learned Mm -hmm. in class. It's never like make this thing completely up on the fly. Let's see how creative you are. Like some, Mm. like, so so that would be a structural thing for me that should change about school. It should be, you know, 10% memorization Mm. instead of 80% memorization. Is there some sort of structural piece of the PhD that in your, that in your opinion should be either tuned down or Mm. just completely disregarded? Well, so I've, my PhD has been kind of unique. Uh, like you explained, I'm doing it with Yale and Maastricht University. And so I've had a PhD experience that I would say is closer to what a postdoc might be doing. So I essentially just did my experiments. I did my research designs, I analyzed data. I published data. Um, while most PhD students, especially in the States, they also have to um, do like uh they have to teach undergrads and uh they have to take certain courses and stuff and so from their experience it sounds like all these extra things that you have be beside your research kind of feels a little silly and i know that a lot of my friends that phd students when they teach undergrads they like don't care they only care like about tests and stuff they don't take any interest in what they're doing so it feels like a waste of time for both parties that you're not doing research mm. Um, and certain courses that sometimes they take where they feel like I already know this. And I feel like everybody's felt that about courses in the past. We're just like, this is not going to be helpful for me in the future. And, you know, I'm stuck here. Um, but otherwise in terms of my research experience, like eventually things that sometimes felt like they could be to none. And that I think is really individual. It just depends on the lab and group that you're in. But, um, Sometimes it feels that certain projects could just be going faster, that we don't need to talk about the same thing over and over again over several months. We can just kind of like try and get it going. Um, So there's definitely, there's a lot of administrative things that can slow down the process. Um, I know that for some people, they might say that um, there's like, ethics and protocols that need to be approved that's just like a pain in the butt and it takes forever i'm personally one for ethical things taking a while because i do want you know to make sure that if you do experiments with animals they're doing them being done in the safest way possible causing the least pain possible etc but there's definitely a lot of extra kerfuffle around research that take just so much time Mm -hmm. and and you just want to be able to do your research Mm -hmm. so this is my 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 outside observation of the science science uh science (laughs) yes i haven't 
I haven't done much science thing, but but in my observation and, and from some things that you've told me and then listening to other podcasts or some documentaries about people in science, it seems like there's a lot of kind of like bullshit. I don't even know if bureaucracy is the right mm-hmm. word, but like like if you if you want to do something if you want to put a paper out there mm-hmm. the peer review process to me just doesn't make sense and i know that people will say that oh like if you, you want to make sure it's good mm-hmm. so it has to go through other scientists and then those scientists have to approve it but for me it's like you're getting your paper reviewed by competition because there's only so many other journals so whether it's a good person or not and I know there are great people in science. I would say most people are good in science. It's just that the the system may be fucked up and causes people mm-hmm. to uh, like puts pressure on people to act certain ways. Like no matter how good of a person you are, when a colleague submits their paper to you, uh, or maybe it's someone you don't know. I think it's anonymous, right? It is. Yeah. Um, you know that person is potentially taking a spot away from you, especially if they're in a similar field or doing something that's related mm-hmm. to your work. Mm-hmm. And that, I imagine, has to have an effect on how you go through reviewing papers, mm-hmm. knowing that if I give this good marks or if I say if I'm super supportive of this, yeah, they're going to get a spot in this journal, which I'm also looking to get a spot in that journal. Mm-hmm. Whereas like in any other field, you just you do work and you put it out there. Mm-hmm. And if it's not good, people recognize that. So like I don't see the problem with putting out bad scientific papers <laughs> because it will just reveal like over time people right. will learn who the bullshit scientists are and who the good scientists are and it's on the journal yeah. I think to research the paper and not put the bad ones in their journal. So like to to me it's just it seems like the peer review process you don't need it it doesn't and it makes science worse okay i mean there's several things that you said some of them do make a lot of sense and and it's true that in a way you know if the papers out there um hopefully you know there's enough smart people to be just like wait a minute like this is this is weird and that has happened before that either the lab itself found that their results were wrong or someone else did and then they retract the paper so that's something that can definitely happen in terms of having the editors of the journal being specialized enough to understand the science, it gets a bit more complicated than that because you have some journals that are like very large, like Cell, Nature. It's just like any kind of science. And like I could not review a paper on primatology. Like I don't know. I know barely anything about primates. And so You're I'm def- a primate. <laughs> well, you I mean, are it, one. I mean, aside from that, yeah. But like, yeah. I mean, something about you know, rewards in primates or monkeys or whatnot. Like I could maybe understand the paper, but am I qualified to review it? Absolutely not. So in the sense that we have people that know this field well, I do think is a good thing. Um, One thing I would say in terms of the competitiveness, it can happen that you have competitors. Overall, I would say each researcher has a pretty niche field that he's working on where kind of everybody knows each other. So often when you send a paper, you'll like know who this is. You've like met them before and you don't try necessarily to attack each other in the back, but it can happen that another group is working on the same thing as you and they want to like beat you at it. And so maybe that'll be particularly difficult so that they can publish first. That can happen. I think it's pretty rare. But so one thing that has happened in the past is if a reviewer is being too difficult is asking too much then you just retract your paper and send it to a different journal so what would happen if you just got rid of the peer review process you wrote a paper as a scientist you performed the experiment and like other forms of uh writing like journalism for example you finish it you either work for a magazine or you mm-hmm. send it into the magazine and then that magazine decides what the sources are, are the sources valid mm-hmm. does this make sense they'll corroborate it with other people if they're a good magazine why can't that be the case in science why can't you write a paper send it into cell or nature mm-hmm. they look at it they're like sorry or like oh the, like, we actually want to publish this why does it have to go it's so, like i would i would be so suspicious if in podcasting there were these other podcasters that I had to get through before mm. I would even 
sniff publishing, like before right. I even get close to publishing the podcast, if I had to send this podcast anonymously, uh, even though it wouldn't be anonymous because people because people right. could figure out who I am by my voice. But if I say there were a group of 10 other podcasters that were randomly assigned my podcast and if they found enough problems with my podcast, I wouldn't be allowed to release it. I wouldn't be able to go on to the next step. To me, that process is never going to be clean. It's never going to be completely clean. Yeah. In some cases, it may work. But in other cases, it's like other like whether you like it or not, people have ulterior motives. And the world always runs best when you feed into people's incentives. So mm -hmm. your incentive as a scientist mm -hmm. is to write a good paper, yeah. to get published. You want, you know, as many people do, you want to be known as a good scientist, you want notoriety fame, and the magazine wants to be known as a credible magazine. Yeah. So that will incentivize them to not accept your paper yeah. if it's bullshit and they'll yeah. do their due diligence. So what, like, that's, I guess, the, the missing piece for me is if this magazine's incentivized to publish good science if you're incentivized to do good science why do you need the middlemen of other mm. scientists to say this is worth publishing or this is not worth publishing because it gets too complicated like i mean the editor of the journal has a role like you first send it to the editor and the editor decides whether this is even worthy of their journal and then they just send it to scientists to double check that the science checks out Because if they publish this paper by just their pure judgment and then a bunch of scientists were like, this is wrong, like then the editor looks bad and their journal looks bad. And so they want to avoid that. So they get it checked out by other scientists to make sure that like they're like, okay, the idea of this science looks cool. It fits the idea of my journal, but I want to make sure that the science is correct. And this is way too complicated for me to mm -hmm. judge that. So the scientists judge it. They can give their opinion and then hopefully you can make everybody happy and then it gets published and if it's too much of it said it's beyond the scope of his journal then you send it to a different journal yeah i i think i have a a good clean solution and i don't see a way that this could go wrong at all when i when i project the future in my own head battle I, I, to the death mm -hmm. battle to the death uh that's a good option so what I think, this is like a, a way, like nothing could go wrong, pure incentives, just like a very good, clean process. I'm going to start a journal called Auxoro Science. Oh. And for those of you listening, you know, if you know, if you know someone that's, you know, maybe they're, they're, they call themselves a scientist, but they haven't actually went to school, but they're, you know, running sketchy experiments out of their basement. Uh, maybe it's someone who you're like, oh, you know, like my, you know, my friend, he, he found a really good way to cook souffle. Like he's running an <laughs> experiment in his kitchen. Like what's the best way? Or, you know, maybe, maybe you have a legit lab in your basement. You're a bootstrapped scientist. You said, you know what? Like I'm done with the bureaucracy. I'm done with the PhD. I'm just going to do the work myself. And, I, and I'm basically going to be like the independent, uh, version of scientists like people that aren't signed by a label in music like you're just going to be like yo i'm doing it myself submit my uh submit to my journal auxoro science uh zach at auxoro.com <laughs> and i will post the the best uh scientific uh self-reviewed by me i'm gonna give it a quick scan and if it you know it checks out uh then it'll uh you know i i'm 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 very confident in saying that I can self-review better than any scientist out there can, uh, many that, better Checks than out. any group of scientists can uh, peer review. And I, and I give it a quick read through, like words on this page. There's like 400 words on this page. I just took that all in right now. Mm. And I can tell you right now that everything on that page is good. So that's, <laughs> that, that's the self-review process that I will experience, you know, no discrimination here. Like it's just about the words on the page. And Auxoro Science is being launched. So you'll be happy to know that you won't be the first. There's shark journals that already exist, and they'll even. What are they called? Shark. Yeah, I mean, I I can't remember. I think it's shark. Like we call them. Sharks. Oh, it's about shark. No, it's not about sharks. Oh. Well, they, if you if you are studying journals, sharks, if you are studying sharks, there are it. journals that even would be willing to pay you, and they'll publish anything. And actually, there is. I could this, send you some Bitcoin if you're thinking about there's, it. There's there's this paper that's absolutely hilarious where 
he wanted to like prove the danger of the, it's kind of like fake news you know like you've got those news outlets they're not really real those journals are basically the same and that's why we have this thing called impact factor where you can check like each journal has an impact factor the higher the more like reputed journal you have like the most well-respected journals and so those uh journals they'll they just want to publish anything and so there's a scientist that did this test where he sent to nine different journals a paper that where instead of talking about mitochondria uh use the word midichlorians like in star wars at some point in the text it had an entire monologue from star wars in it the references included wikipedia and just he put jokes everywhere yeah. and was published by six out of nine of them that will okay so <laughs> wouldn't that that would get more people to read scientific papers if it read more like a journal article or it had pop culture references i a lot of times i don't even get past the abstract because i'm like right there's and you know 200 words in the abstract and i couldn't understand 192 of them so yeah. i'm like how am i supposed to read 46 pages mm. on cell autophagy when you know i the only two words i know are cell autophagy mm -hmm. i'm not even sure i know, know what autophagy means <laughs> <laughs> or cell. <laughs> What's I, a cell i i i don't know i just know i have them but <laughs> um that that makes me think of uh that we're talking about like self-published uh scientific papers there were a couple guys that went on joe rogan and i'm recalling this uh from memory i don't have it in in front of me right now so i hope i'm remembering this correctly and you could probably find look this episode up easily uh just based on certain keywords i forget the guy's name but it, it's two guys that were trying to trick legit scientific journals into accepting their papers mm -hmm. because they wanted to show how fucked up the peer review journal process was mm -hmm. that they they wanted only certain results that skewed what they were they, they skewing liberal like most mm. most magazines were skewed very liberal and were willing to accept super uh like liberal even mm. like wrong science if it painted people mm. to look the way that they wanted to yeah. so they made this fake study up about uh, being able to tell how uh, how toxic a man was or, or uh, what was it like how toxic a man was by how often his dog humped other dogs or humped <laughs> other people like they, they were they were saying they were observing males and I don't remember if it was toxic masculinity or homophobia or a combination of those but they were saying that based on how the dog acted like it was humping other dogs mm -hmm. or humping other people that that you could then predict toxic masculinity in the male owners of those dogs and the journal was like oh my god like this is amazing mm -hmm. like they didn't actually do the study they just faked it and sent it right. in and then the journal actually wrote them back multiple times and said hey this isn't enough can you make it even more absurd like not telling them to fake it, but like maybe send in some more absurd results. And the journal was clearly leading them on yeah. with n not a, the truth in mind, but to paint a certain picture about, in this case, men and male dog owners um, to feed into the, the current narrative of toxic what masculinity. What journal was that? It was, I, don't, I don't remember what journal it was, but I, I know that it was a journal that people consider legitimate. I'd have to... I'd have to look uh, at it. If you're listening sure to this, you're not like just taking the piss or something. No, no, it was an entire episode dedicated to the the articles, multiple articles that these guys had that were published now taken down in scientific journals. And I'm sure if you looked up like Joe Rogan, scientific journals, uh, dog humping, like yeah. you'll find the two guys. But on the if podcast. anything, if anything, this highlights why we need peer reviews because then you have the editor that's just like, oh, that sounds cool. That's something we'd like to publish. And then you have peers that review that the science is correct, that you didn't just make up stuff, that the stats are like legit and stuff. So like if you remove that middleman that actually checks if what you're saying is bullshit or not, then you'll just have a bunch of bullshit online and that'll just be up to anyone reading the paper to believe you or not. And But like I do agree that in the sense that because you do have this process, you tend to 
um, like believe whatever you see. Like I know I personally, if I have a paper that's published by Nature or Cell, like one of the leading journals in the field, uh, I'll tend Oxoro Science <laughs> exactly. I'll tend to be like, okay, like overall, I'll approach this paper being like. I'm, I feel pretty, like, this is quite trustworthy. Like, it's a, just like, you know, when you read an article by the New York Times or National Geographic, you tend to be like, mm -hmm. okay, I, I think I can trust them. Uh, but I'll be more skeptical of like a journal that has a lower impact, impact factor that I don't know as well. Um, but I know also that even if, if I knew that like no one had read this paper before it was published, that it would be my job to be extra cautious in reading between the lines to make sure that they're not full of shit. Yeah. But even in journals like that, you have, there's no peer review process when you publish an article in the New York Times. They have an internal review process where they have an editor, you have the journalist, maybe you run it by a couple other journalists mm -hmm. before it gets published. You have a fact checker. Yeah. But there's no, like, you're not, you're not appearing in front of a tribunal of other journalists where people are anonymously grading your uh, paper or not that I know of. Maybe they do that at the New York Times, but then the reputation of that journal builds over time. And we, the, yeah. the people, whether it's a, a cable news station or it's a journal, if you choose to publish shitty science or shitty news over time, your reputation will degrade even if you were once known as a good journal so i think the yeah. reputation and people's people's own um you know willingness to talk about the things that they're reading and listening to the, the things will handle themselves out so if you get rid of the peer review process even the journals like cell or nature if they continue mm -hmm. to publish shitty science sure people might hear those names and think oh this is a reputable journal mm -hmm. but over time they might become more of like the like shitty what do you call it like tabloid like they'd be like mm -hmm. tabloid science yeah and the ones that actually do a good job there would be a reputational shift uh based on how people are perceiving your work and and um, how good that work actually is. Yeah, but then if you had a system like that, for them to be reputable, they'd ha have to just get lucky. If they just publish any paper without being reviewed and if without checking if the science is good, then it's just a gamble. And it's just like, let's hope that nobody's going to like tell me later that this paper is a hoax. So this is why you go through the peer review. This is how you build reputation. Because otherwise, the other alternatives will be these journals only publish people they know are doing good science. So as a starting scientist, you'd have not a shot ever at being in a big journal. So we need this in-between process to prove the science is good so this, the journal can keep its reputation and the scientist can move forward as well. Do you think as a scientist, if you were doing peer review, do you think that you could separate your ideology from the science? Like like in, in the case of the two guys on Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. the scientists uh, that were peer reviewing their quote unquote research on dog humping and their mm -hmm. owners obviously had some sort of political agenda or ideology that they were using the mm -hmm. science as a tool to fulfill. And like whether you want to acknowledge it or not, it seems like science is mostly liberal. So then that skews towards science that mm. may show liberal thing, uh, like the final result points towards some sort of liberal ideology, which shouldn't be how science is. It should be whatever the results are and yeah. where that falls on the liberal, conservative, mm -hmm. left or right. It, you, you need to be able to separate that. And my my thinking is that peer review only enhances that process of skewing results towards a political agenda. And mm -hmm. it still happens in journalism, New York Times, yeah. like, uh, like yeah. what um, certain uh, periodicals, newspapers, they're, they're definitely left or right leaning views. And that's to be expected. No paper is completely unbiased because the people yes. writing those things mm -hmm. have biases. Like I have a bias yes. recording this right now and people are probably listening to this saying like, oh, he skews more this way or he skews more that way. But to me, I'm just someone talking. Yeah. I mean, okay. So we're human beings. So mm -hmm. we have ideologies, we have thoughts, et cetera. And 
it's obviously impossible to completely block that out. However, I would say that the majority of scientists tend to go where the data is. So this study, I've not listened to that particular podcast and I'll definitely check it out after. But if I did a fake study and the data is good, like... In a way, like, why wouldn't you believe it? Like, there's like because there, it's a f- it's a fake well, it study. Was, of course, it's a fake study, and that's part of the problem. It's just like in the same way that you know physicians take an oath that they'll protect and etc. Like, I can't remember the exact oath. It's, there is a similar oath with scientists that we're going to be telling the truth that we are going to be, you know, going where the data is, and we're just not going to make up studies. But I mean, it's possible that there is like some people that make it up. And if the data makes sense, unless someone is actually trying to reproduce it. And some people are, they try to reproduce past studies to see if the data checks out. It's, yeah, you just, you just have to like, I guess, trust, you know, that they didn't make up the data because that's just your responsibility of a scientist not to do that. Well, I think in that particular case, it was extreme enough where the person should have questioned is you know i mean this i don't work saying there's a correlation between yeah. dog humping and the behavior i mean of the it owners. sounds ridiculous I, I, at the same time you know like if again i've not seen this study i would be interested to see how well they've done the science and everything mm. i don't work in psychology i feel like it's definitely more difficult when you look at things like that but for me like working with sodium channels and pain in cells etc like there's nothing political about that like if they tell me like eventually i can try to be um more objective like something that we've seen a lot like we know that women and men feel pain differently and that's something that we've been able to see in rodents as well so if there is a study that only use male rodents i'd be like well your study is biased and it's skewed because you only use male rodents Mm -hmm. i'm not saying that because i'm a woman and i'm like all for women rights even though i am I'm saying that because the study is biased towards only male rodents. So they should include female rodents, what if, this kind of thing. What if you were looking under a microscope and you saw a group of cells that spelled out, build the wall? <laughs> you would still say that cells are unbiased. I think I'd definitely make it to the big journals <laughs> if that happened. I managed to get cells to say, build the wall. No, they just did it by themselves. Yeah. But um, cells by themselves. Yeah. Um, okay. So you think peer review benefits I think, I think science not, more than it detracts from it i think it's not a perfect system and i definitely think that incentive can be a driver of wrong science and inaccurate science and i wish i could say that you know science is accurate and we can trust it a hundred percent um in terms of you know like data etc of course like you know if there are several studies that say one thing and are able to reproduce the data of course it's definitely true and scientists are being careful with their conclusions always and this is why it's very important that when you do your own research to really like read papers properly and not just like jump some lines like some news outlets have done um but you know there, there is some problems with academia and the publication industry, including the fact that there's some journals happening more and more that publish negative data, but there is an incentive for you to publish positive results. And while I don't believe that scientists will purposely, you know, skew their data, etc., sometimes, you know, statistical tests aren't like can, can be used in different ways. And so you can. Like you, the data can eventually lead to something that you want without you necessarily lying about it. So it's it's dif- it, it's hard to say that it's completely black and white, but I do believe that the majority of scientists have the incentive that they want the truth to come out and have accurate, good science come out. And that's exactly what we're about at Auxoro Science. <laughs> like we're gonna change, we're gonna change the field. So okay, something that I wanted to ask you. Mm. Because you've uh, studied so much about the the brain and and pain and kind of like the way we perceive different things, what is your take on like what do you think about reality? Do you think that we're living in a simulation? <laughs> do you think that everything that we see is exactly the way that it is? Do you think we're seeing projections of other things and we're just kind of like making sense of it like when when you hear other people talk about the reality question which comes up a lot nowadays like what 
what are your thoughts on it when you think about like what what really is this all is this around a Truman us? Show? Am I Truman kind of thing? Could be. Um, I mean, I definitely think that we live in reality. I don't think we're in the Matrix, but who knows? I could be wrong. Well, is reality <laughs> the Matrix, or would reality be the uh, <laughs> pre the pre Matrix when they're living in the club and the you know they're partying and they're walking through the city? Like, which is what? What I, is reality? I do feel that uh, everybody has a different experience and. You know, we have different cells that make up our eyes. And so we, you probably don't see the same colors that I do. And I mean, we know obviously with people with conditions such as color blindness, it's even a whole other thing. I don't thing, see but color. Am I in black and white right now? Yes. No. Yes, you are. <laughs> no, I'm just imitating uh, what politicians say when uh, someone asks them, or someone accuses oh, them of being racist. I, right. I, don't, I don't see color. Right. I don't perceive it. That's the reality that I live in. <laughs> Hogsworth 2024. Jeez. Um, um, but yeah, what what do you what do you think is like? What would be your best guess as to how real this is, or or what even reality is from a substantial level? Like, is this actually real? Or is it a projection of something? Are we brains sitting in vats? Like, what do you think? <laughs> I think about this a lot. It's. I mean, this is great, you know, um, shower thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I don't question as much as you. Maybe, like, I've, I do feel that through my scientific journey, I've, I've lost a little bit of uh, my, um, not creativity, but like the, the little mad spark of what is, what is really happening in the world. But uh, I do think that this is reality, and I do think that everybody perceives it differently based on um like something you know as colors and sound can be perceived differently because of how your cells are how your genes are um and i also think you know depending on how your brain is you can perceive things differently and that's why you have people that can hear different sounds that can mm. see different things and and depending on how your brain is wired will affect the way that you perceive the world and you move around inside of it uh but I do think that this is real and I do think that we all on earth right now and we need to be good to it. Well, <laughs> I specifically remember a moment when I was in middle school and I can actually picture it. I was standing outside the cafeteria walking through the hallway and I the thought for the first time ever, because I've had this thought multiple times, a thought popped into my head that am I the only actual person on this planet that is conscious and everyone else is just a simulated projection? Anyone, that's every, a very narcissistic view. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's, you know, podcasting comes with it. I just <laughs> talk for two hours and uh, force people to listen to it. Um, but like, I thought, like, how do I... It, it wasn't that I thought that was the case it was more me thinking about the proof of how do you even know if someone else is real like how much can i trust my senses mm -hmm. and now i have a more i mean a little bit more sophisticated vocabulary to think and talk about that type of stuff but you know st i'm still i would say i'm pretty average in terms of intelligence but like at the time i remember just wondering about how i knew if other people were like me, are they mm. seeing me the way that mm -hmm. I see them? How mm -hmm. do I like, what's the proof that there are other people that are conscious in this world besides me? And it's kind of like, um, ah, fuck, I forgot who's, who said it, a famous philosopher, but th the only thing I know is that I am. Yeah. And that everything else, like how, like there's no way, how do you know someone else is? is it, I think therefore I am. I think therefore I am. <laughs> yes. Are you the guy? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I remember having those thoughts and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I would say now my, my thoughts about reality fall more in line with we like a, a combination of reality and a simulation. Like what we're seeing is mostly real, mm -hmm. but 
there's an we're seeing one layer of it. We're we're seeing right. what we need to survive yeah. and live a fulfilled life. But if we saw everything, we wouldn't be able to function. So like our brains only pick up certain things, which we already know. We know our brains can only see on a certain spectrum, hear on a certain spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I think that is not designed for us to perceive all of reality it's just designed to give us as much information as we need to walk through this world but we don't actually see everything that's there there's like other layers that yeah. doesn't like that doesn't matter to us or that we can't see that other species may be able yeah. to see i mean that's that's what natural selection is all about you know like you get a bunch of traits those that are not useful they get rid of and eventually just you know, you, you have what you need to survive in the world. And so, you know, like there are like um, fish that have like x-ray vision and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And it's super cool. And that's also useful for us for like research to like figure out why they do and how we can exploit this for our own um, use. But in terms of, you know, thinking, and I think it is a very human trait, you know, to think that we are so special and I mean, we are in our own way, but in the big scheme of things, like on everything that's on our earth, in our solar system, in our universe, etc., we are so small and so insignificant that that idea of like, like, for example, when you mentioned, like, when I'm, if I'm at that only person with a consciousness, like, I do think it's really cool to think about these things. But then I would ask the question, what would be the point? Like, that would mean that there is a simulation just made for you. Like, who would have interest in doing that? And I know that, like, you you might, like, shift into aliens and things another, like that. Yeah, another, yeah, <laughs> another being that creates separate experiments for beings. And, yeah. put, like, each person, if, if our brains are kind of in that, like, the matrix where you're in your own little thing. And then every person is living in their own unique simulation. Yeah. That feel Like, your senses, everything feels so real. Yeah. And... It, other beings are basically keeping us happy or alive for some reason and the simulation makes sure that we're comfortable while we are doing that i mean as a scientist myself thinking that maybe aliens with advanced technology would think remotely like us in terms of experiments you'd think that they would put us through um, specific obstacles to study us. And I feel mm -hmm. like while some people definitely could be subjects of study, I feel like the two of us, for instance, have fairly happy lives that we would be very boring subjects of experimentation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even if this is a simulation, I very much enjoy the simulation. Mm. Yeah. I think this is the right time to tell you that I've been experimenting on you for the past 27 years <laughs> well how do i know that you are or this is part of the simulation that's trying to make me because i throw me off the trail. science <laughs> wow my mind's being blown right now <laughs> um have you ever heard donald hoffman talk about reality he's a cognitive scientist no. at uc irvine so he thinks that uh perceived reality is like a desktop mm -hmm. and so let's say like this tangerine lacroix mm -hmm. this is like a folder on a desktop okay you see the icon which is the lacroix yeah everything about it says you know like this is a lacroix right you see it on a desktop like if i drag this into a desktop you would see lacroix mm -hmm. and that is the level of reality that we see mm -hmm. but then there's a different level which is what's actually going on in the computer which is a bunch of ones and zeros binary code that is producing the icon that is the lacroix and so um his argument and hopefully i'm phrasing it correctly is that we are seeing basically the icon level like we're we're seeing the desktop of reality there are things that are useful for us we're seeing the projections of the code that is underneath. Right. And the reason that is, he has, uh, I wrote down a quote um, from him that summarizes his view of reality pretty well. Donald Hoffman says, 
we've been shaped to have perceptions that keep us alive. So we have to take them seriously. If I see something that I think of as a snake, I don't pick it up. If I see a train, I don't step in front of it. I've evolved these symbols to keep me alive. So I have to take them seriously. But it's a logical flaw to think that if we have to take it seriously, we also have to take it literally. So it's like, Mm-hmm. All the like we're walking through a world of symbols mm-hmm. and these symbols are useful to us we've evolved to see these symbols and all evolution cares is that we stay alive that we're fit mm-hmm. evolution is a process of fitness and so what we see is not the most accurate thing what we see is the most useful thing to keep us alive so his argument is that based on evolutionary science what we know about it is that we evolve to survive, not to uh, see the truth or know the truth. Like evolution doesn't give a shit about the truth and what's real. We've basically evolved these patterns uh, in our minds or like have, have picked up these projections that allow us to walk through the world and survive and feed ourselves and, and clothe ourselves and form relationships with other people. But if you took away those icons, there's something else there that's projecting these things that we see that if we saw everything it would be like almost too overwhelming mm-hmm. we wouldn't be able to function like it, mm-hmm. it's it's not good for evolution what, what's accurate mm-hmm. i guess his main point is that what's accurate is not what's best for survival so yeah. we only see what we need to see and yeah. so if you peeled back the layer of reality that we see maybe there'd be like code underneath or just like other things like major i don't know what what it is, but there's something that we're not seeing that is the th- that is projecting the reality that we perceive as true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would see so much like there's coding behind and stuff like the literal computer uh, analogy that he's using. But I, I do think that, yeah, indeed, like we, the people that we've evolved to be are the optimized version of humans that we should become because that's that's how we've made it so far Mm -hmm. and there could be a moment in time where we evolve to see more things maybe our brains will then get that capacity to get more information and just be able to you know see x-rays or uvs and things like that and ultimately like he said you use your brain for the purpose that you need it for and nothing beyond that so I would say that the reality we live in is as accurate as the depiction that we have of it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I would agree. And and when you think about it, like, is anything, you know, really real or anything? Like, it's like when you talk about this can and you look at it, like what gives you colors, etc., is like a projection sent back from your mm. brain, etc. Like so, you know, you could like think deep and like, is anything really real? What I touch, what I see, like your brain can create those images as well. And that's what you have like with hallucinations. And sometimes, mm. like, if it's dark and you're a little scared, and there's like, I don't know, like a leaf or a piece of wood on the floor, you're able to actually see something that's not a piece of wood. You can create an entire image from your imagination. Mm -hmm. And then you get closer and you realize, oh, it was just a piece of wood. So your brain has the capacity of creating images and Mm -hmm. creating sounds. So in a way, yeah, Yeah. maybe nothing is real. Maybe it's all a creation of our brain. I mean, you know (laughs) the, yeah. I mean, our brain's creating whatever we see regardless. Mm -hmm. It has to, it has to take signals and then transform them into Mm -hmm. something that works with our uh like neurochemical system or whatever you call it however we're we're seeing our ocular system um there's uh the meditation app that i use that Mm -hmm. you've also started to use waking up by sam harris one of the prompts that you have not well, I, I said you're using a different one. Well, you're yeah. you're meditating, so maybe you've done this uh, certain exercise. Maybe you haven't. But one of the things that Sam Harris prompts you to do while you're meditating, with your eyes opened and closed, mm-hmm. is to f- picture something and focus on it, Mm-mm. like a candle flickering. And what I've realized over time is that you can 
basically make yourself see an image mm-hmm. like what you were talking about even with your eyes open if you almost if you focus long enough you can project something in front of a background and start to see a candle mm-hmm. flickering or um piece of like whatever you're imagining and so that made me think about if we can create some sort of low level image with our mind how do we know what we're seeing is not also a creation and and kind of like what donald hoffman is talking about we see some sort of underlying code or signal Mm -hmm. and then our mind fills in the gaps i mean in that sense i can tell you that this is reality because not everyone is able to create images with their mind there are some people that are completely incapable of picturing an orange they'll be able to describe the orange to you they tell you what it is and that it exists but they can't see it in their mind so that's a very depressing life not to be able to picture an orange when you want to <laughs> if someone said right now gun to your head small fiber neuropathy <laughs> or not being able to picture an orange <sighs> yeah i'd still go with the orange but i'd have to think about it for five seconds um so i wanted to talk about some stuff that well, we could probably do a whole nother podcast on. So maybe we'll do that. We talked about recording more podcasts, mm-hmm. kind of like more casual. I wanted to get into photojournalism and travel and then also picture scientists. Mm-hmm. But I feel like there's we're already at two hours. So instead, <laughs> I'll ask you some more uh, life meaning questions that are impossible oh, to answer great. as we wrap up. And then you can look out for some more podcasts with maybe at the time, Dr. Julie LeBeau. You have an unlimited budget to build a lab slash photography studio workspace. Who do you hire? Where do you build it? How do you build it? Like, there's no obstacle. You can build it in space. You can have it in the Amazon. Like, And for we haven't talked about photography, but that's also... One of your loves uh, Mm -hmm. besides science is taking photos. So if you could, if you had an unlimited budget for a science Mm -hmm. uh, lab, photography, setting, studio, however you wanted to build it, what would you do with that, Mm -hmm. you know, $100 million or whatever you needed to make it? (laughs) That's hard. Um, I mean, I probably would try to put it somewhere where it can be... um, as useful as possible like so maybe yeah somewhere like in the amazon or um close to you know marine coast uh where there would be opportunities for scientists uh from around the world to come to this mm-hmm. research center and like um do field work there um i would definitely need to research like in terms of priorities because there are research centers like that that exist so where such a research center would be useful. And in terms of photography, uh, in the, the, that's not something that we really talked about, but I think something around um, conservation and um, could directly correlate with the work that would be done at the research center. So once again, you know, there's a lot of um, fauna, animals uh, in those areas that require conservation and uh, care and they are like in affected areas that uh, are already directly impacted by climate change etc so I would try probably to build it uh, somewhere where we can hopefully make a strong Mm -hmm. impact if you were handling an extremely venomous snake Mm -hmm. and you had to choose one person for it to bite or else it would bite you who would you pick or would you take the bite yourself mm. and you don't have an antidote oh um i mean most venomous snake bites uh don't lead to death so you know hopefully that w- i would be okay um but it would be very uncomfortable i wouldn't want anyone else to take the bite so i'll just uh, take it myself okay you're a better person. Maybe, maybe you're a better you. person than me. If you've been annoying, maybe I'll I'll throw you under the under the teeth of. Where would you have it bite me? Um, if you got this, pick the spot. On your butt. That's a good spot. That's the it doesn't co- hurt you too cushion, much. 
Yeah. There's not. I don't think there's too many blood vessels no, in your exactly. butt, so, you so it'll take wouldn't a while die. for it to. <laughs> so you probably wouldn't die, and it wouldn't hurt as much, but I would still feel like, ha, 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 got my revenge. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, have to take some time off of spanking for a little bit, or just only the right cheek. <laughs> uh, if Who you said it was going to be the right one. Hmm? Who said it was going to be the right one? That's true. It's it is. Uh, you can make the uh, the decision for that. I'll allow it. I'll mm-hmm. allow it. If you could go, so one of the things uh, that you also, that we mentioned is you like adventures, hiking, mm-hmm. climbing, diving, um, that we'll, you know, we'll probably get into on a future podcast as well. If you could only go on one more adventure in nature in your life, so like a one month long mm. adventure and, it, and you could only do one thing so you couldn't be like oh i just want to do everything in a month Mm -hmm. like you had to do one activity for about a month and that was the last nature adventure you could do so like hiking climbing etc and then after that you're done so you got one month of something what would you pick where would you do it um one expedition one choice i think i i would um i would do like a kayaking hiking journey through the amazon i don't know exactly which part of it which country but um something in the amazon for a month yeah it's canada probably (laughs) i think it goes yeah that one all right well that is that is a good choice we can talk about that in round two yeah i can't wait thank you future dr julie lebeau (laughs) for hopping on the podcast uh thank you guys for listening uh, don't forget to submit your journal entries for the most legitimate journal on the planet, which is mm-hmm. Auxor Science. And I'll link all the places that you can go check out Julie's work on Instagram. Uh, she'll probably have a website up by then as well. And so, yeah, thank you guys for listening. Go check out our work and share this podcast with someone you care about if you enjoy it.